this is where I think things get really interesting. The Ace of Clubs hits the river. We don't want to force our opponent to play optimally and only continue with hands that are ahead. Maybe you just want to call pre-flop and look to bluff catch the whole way with your pocket tens. Against a player like this, I don't know if you can turn your hand into a bluff. We need to make him pay for that privilege. Potentially you're going to get outplayed by a really good player, or you're going to get beat by a player with a better hand. I think I would check, hoping for a free showdown. In my opinion, this was a really good example of having a plan and working it, but being willing to adapt as needed. I think I'm probably just going to check call in this situation. We ended up at the river with 40% of our chips on the table. Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast, officially sponsored by Running Aces Casino and Racetrack. I'm your host, Steve Fredland, and I want to start this episode by thanking many of you. Uh, I've asked for feedback, and many of you have been engaged enough to send some, uh, and some of that feedback has resulted in deciding to slightly change the format. Uh, no big things, but starting with this episode, uh, what I'm going to do is set up the situation and then spend some time breaking it down from my perspective, and then we're going to hear from the professionals at that point, and then we will end the podcast with the recreational player's input. I know some of you have really been chomping at the bit to get to the pros, uh, and so I want to put that more up front in the episode so you don't have to hunt and peck for it, and then uh, when you're done listening to that input, if you want to listen to the recreational players, that's awesome. Uh, if not, uh, we won't have any... Uh, content beyond the recreational player's input. So I'm uh, mixing it up a little bit. Let me know what you think, uh, positive, negative, any of that stuff. I do listen to all the feedback, and I do try to incorporate what I can. So uh, thanks to those of you who took me seriously uh, when I asked for input. So this week we have a situation from our own Taylor Moss, and we're going to have input from a couple of great professional poker players, Jonathan Little, who many of you know with PokerCoaching.com, and Chris Fox Wallace, who's a World Series of Poker bracelet winner and leads Next Level Poker, which is our official tour for Rec Poker. And we also have thoughts from a ton of recreational contributors, some great players included in this list, including Matt Hamilton, Don Ducate, Andy Kaplan, Rob Washam, Derek Smith, Steve Olson, and Doug Barron. So fantastic, uh, good input on today's episode. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, I do have an investment package that I'm putting together for Vegas. Uh, I'm not playing any bracelet events. Uh, I found my sweet spot, and they are in the daily tournaments, those daily deep stacks. So I'm putting a package together to play a bunch of those and some other daily tournaments while I'm out there. Let me know if you have any interest in that. Also, uh, as I mentioned before, patches are available. We have a number of you who have already reached out saying you want a patch. Uh, We've received uh, our first batch of patches which do not have the adhesive backing on them. So if you want one of those, I'll send it out. Uh, You'd have to sew it on or apply your own adhesive for more of a permanent patch. Uh, But we should be getting in the next week or so those that have adhesive backing. And so we will send those out to those of you who are looking for those. But thanks to those of you who are willing to wear them. Uh, I think it's a a fantastic way to represent Rec Poker and spread the word. So if you want to do that, feel free to reach out to me uh, on Facebook, Twitter, email, stevefredland at gmail.com or leave a comment on SoundCloud or wherever you're getting your uh, your podcast here. Uh, so today we're going to tackle a hand situation from Taylor Moss, as I mentioned, and we're going to give a quick shout-out to Running Aces first, and then we'll be back, and Taylor will set up that situation for us. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack has the best poker room in Minnesota, featuring 24-7 promos on all cash poker games, including earning $2 per hour in comps plus the most player-friendly tourney structures. Visit RunAces.com for daily promotions and the tournament calendar. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, the official sponsor of Rec Poker. Greetings, Rec Poker listeners. This is Taylor Moss. This week we're discussing a hand that I submitted. Uh, We are playing a 6-max online tournament. Uh, We are in the middle stages of the tournament with 180 players remaining. After about 400 total entries, and top 54 will get paid. As it stands, we're about 40th in, out of the 180 with 28,000 in chips. Uh, and the villain in this hand is third in chips, so one of the big stacks uh, with 67,000 in chips. Uh, so in this hand, I think there's a lot of things to consider as we go through. Um, kind of how do we approach playing against a big stack when we're in the middle stages of a tournament when we're also a fairly big stack 
what is our approach when we're in the middle of the stages of the tournament? Are we going to go for this big chip stack? Are we going to try and play more conservative uh, since we're still quite a bit away from the money? Um, and then also kind of what's our overall approach with three betting and bluffing as it comes on the river. Um, so as the hand plays out, uh, we do have information about our villain. Uh, so our villain in this hand is going to be in the cutoff, uh, but recently has added quite a bit of chips to his stack, and likewise has also picked up his aggression. He went from 11,000 to 67,000 in the past 16 hands, and he's played 10 of those. So he's picked up the aggression, uh, been playing more hands, seeing more flops, etc. Um, out of the total 56 hand sample size, he's been playing 38% of them, uh, with 17 of them being a pre-flop raise. So generally a little bit more passive pre-flop. Um, usually the pre-flop raise is a higher percent of the times that they're voluntarily putting chips into play, uh, so a little bit passive of an opponent. He's only three bet once. Um, is still a small sample size, but probably should have been higher if he's a little bit more aggressive. Uh, never four bet, again, not too crazy. Every time that he's raised preflop, he has C bet the flop. Um, and every time that he has been uh, kind of the passive person and called a raise, he's folded to a C bet about half the time, three out of seven times. He's won every hand that he's went to showdown. So every time that he's gone to the river, um, he's had the goods. And in his three big winning hands, he's called pre-flop all ins uh, with king jack offsuit and ace, ace queen offsuit. And then the big winning hand, he open limped, then called a raise pre-flop with deuces. And then on a flop of two, three, four, shoved all in over a c-bet when he had a set. Uh, the original bet was 2.1 thousand and his shove was for 422. Um, so onto the hand. Our villain is in the cutoff. Uh, the under the gun player folds. Villain in the cutoff raises to a thousand when the blinds are 250, 500. Uh, button folds, small blind folds, and we're in the big blind with the 10 of spades, 10 of hearts. Here we decide to three bet. Uh, our opponent has been playing a lot of hands. This is kind of our way of uh, getting him to put in chips when we think we have a better hand. Uh, so I think this is a three bet for value, not for a bluff. Uh, the villain decides to call. Uh, so we go to the flop. Uh, knowing with tens that we're kind of going to be in a tough spot, we're not likely to flop big, uh, but we got to hope that our opponent does not hit the flop. So the flop comes king of spades, five of hearts, six of clubs. Not a bad flop for our hand. Um, we should uh, be in a fairly good spot. When he calls our three bet, he doesn't have a lot of those premium hands in his range. Uh, so we decide to see bet. We make it the exact same bet that we did pre-flop and bet 3,500. Uh, and the villain calls. So given this, I think it's fun to think about what our opponent has. Uh, I don't think he has ace-king, uh, given that uh, he's shown aggression, aggression when he's had hands, and when he's had kind of those middling hands, he's been much more passive, and here he's being passive again. So uh, pre-flop, I would expect hands like ace-king, aces, kings, uh, queens, jacks, those types of things to th are actually four bet us. Um, but given that he's never 4-bet before, I don't think we can make a, a set read on that. Um, but th the main hands I'm thinking he has here is kind of like a weak king. Uh, I call it like a king-queen, king-jack, king-10. Um, there's some straight draws with 7-8, all those suited hands in there as well. Um, we have to be worried about fives and sixes, but given his previous aggression when he flopped a set, I think we're okay kind of excluding those out of our range. Uh, so I think our villain has a very kind of medium strength hand. Uh, so the turn comes the three of hearts making the board king of spades, five of hearts, six of clubs, three of hearts. So 
Uh, it connects a straight if he had a very weird hand, such as 4-7 or, or deuce 4, so I'm not worried about a straight here. It does give uh, outs to a heart flush, so we have to be somewhat concerned about that. On the turn, I'm a little bit uh, curious as to what the best option here is because we very likely could be up against a king and we only have a pair of tens. Uh, but do we want to give up on the aggression here? We could definitely check and then decide after how our opponent reacts to that. Uh, but I decided that I was going to bet, but not bet big. I was actually going to bet small. I thought I was going to get a decent amount of information from this bet and typically bets for information are a terrible idea, but that's kind of the approach that I went with. Uh, so I bet 4,000 expecting to get raised by uh, good hands, uh, folds from the hands that kind of missed, maybe like the seven eights, and then calls from, again, those middle type hands, that king jack, king ten-ish type hand. And that's what our opponent does. Our opponent does call our turn bet, uh, which we go to a river, and this is where I think things get really interesting. The ace of clubs hits the river. So I think for a lot of our opponent's range, this ace is absolutely terrible and gives us a bluff opportunity. Plus, every straight draw, every flush draw missed, and if we range our opponent, what types of hands do they have in their range that this ace hits, or the ace does not scare them? So we have 17,000 left. Uh, the pot is, I believe, roughly right around 17,000. And we're left with the decision of what do we do here? Do we continue the aggression and kind of bluff with this ace, uh, pretending that it's good for our hand? Uh, do we check call? Do we check fold? Or do we take another option and bet fold? And um, it, I think it could be any of those things, and I'm very interested to see what the other recreational players as well as the pros think of this hand, because I think there's a lot of interesting ways that we can take this hand. I clearly took an aggressive approach on the flop. Uh, another aggressive approach on the turn but not super aggressive kind of trying to represent a, a very thin value bet and then now in the river i think it's hard for our opponent to range us um, where the ace could be good for our range and we could bluff them off of a hand so i'm leaving this one up to the rec poker nation what do we do here do we bluff on this river or do we give up thanks for the input all right, thanks so much, Taylor. When I think about this scenario, I, I first think about the decision pre-flop, and I base it on a few different things. First of all, uh, reduce fold equity here. Uh, my opponent uh, is generally pretty loose, or at least they've been loosened up dramatically recently. Uh, maybe the deck is just hitting in their head, but based on what Taylor has said, the stats provided, it seems like they're pretty loose. Uh, and because of this, I don't think I'm going to have the same fold equity that I would have, say, three betting over a tighter player uh, who would maybe have a wider than normal opening range playing five-handed, uh, something like that. So I don't think I have as much fold equity as I normally might uh, with, with pocket tens out of the blinds. Secondly, I consider position. Uh, I am out of position against this opponent. So if they don't fold to my three bet, I'm likely going to have some difficult decisions all the way through. My experience tells me that playing out of position results in smaller wins and bigger losses, not to mention just more losses from playing out of position. So the value of my 10 shrinks up here significantly when I consider being out of position against a player who I don't feel I have a lot of fold equity against. And the third thing is underrepresentation. And this is quickly becoming one of my favorite tools in Hold'em tournaments as long as it's used sparingly. Underrepresenting pocket tens in this spot can serve two great purposes. First of all, it helps with pot control because I'm playing this more passively and therefore I'm not building a huge pot, especially out of position with a hand that if it doesn't improve will likely be the second or the third pair by the river. And also it induces bluffs. If I show relative weakness, my opponent will be more likely to bluff in spots or even better think his pair lower than mine is good. So when I think about these three factors working together, I actually like just calling pre-flop in this spot and not three-betting. 
The downside of this approach is that you could get outflopped or eventually outdrawn, but I do believe the passive line with this hand in this situation against this opponent is ultimately the more profitable long term, especially in tournaments when survival is a key consideration. But if we look at this situation specifically, Taylor did choose to 3-bet, which certainly is not unreasonable at all, and he was called. So as played, what do we do with the King-5-6 rainbow flop? I would definitely consider a check call in this spot, but I believe this flop is better for our 3-betting range than for their 3-bet calling range. So I'm actually looking for a flop like this to C-bet. So something like a king with two little cards is, is almost perfect. There's not much for draws out here other than something like 8-7 and 4-3. So I think a C-bet is a good idea here, and hopefully we can just take down the pot right there, which would be a good result. Unfortunately, we get called by the villain, which is actually going to help us range them a bit. So the next step is really thinking about what is our villain's range. They raised, and then they called a 3-bet preflop. And then they called, and not raised, a continuation bet postflop. Now at a five-handed table, I could see them having any pocket pairs from pocket jacks through pocket twos. And I do think they would call a 3-bet and then float the flop continuation bet with a pocket pair, knowing we could just have something like ace-jack or ace-queen or even something like we have, pocket tens, that they potentially could steal from us later with scare cards. I also think they could have suited connectors like 8-7, 7-6, 6-5, 5-4, 4-3, and then a myriad of kings, even possibly ace-king, but also king-queen, king-jack, and king-ten. Probably not king-nine and king-eight, unless maybe if they're suited. So, I think there's a fair amount that they could have that beats us, but also a reasonable amount here that does not. Now, the turn comes a pretty good card for us, a three that brings the second heart to the board. Now, what do we do here, assuming we three bet the flop and then continuation bet the turn? At this point, I still like my hand against their range. The problem with betting here is that you do start optimizing your opponent's play. At this point, what would they continue with are either made hands that beat us, those combinations of kings or two pairs or even sets of threes, fives, and sixes, or big draws, straight and or flush draws now. Hands that are worse than ours, pocket nines, eights, sevens, seven six, etc., will likely fold at this point. Or if they were just floating us with real garbage, like a seven suited, they would also fold. I think this is another great spot to check with the likely plan of check calling. We want to induce bluffs at this point. We don't want to force our opponent to play optimally and only continue with hands that are ahead. There is a chance that we could go check check and therefore help us range our opponent off of a king while also controlling the pot. But if we are going to put in a bet, I would rather do it as a check call to induce those bluffs and be building a pot when there is a better chance that we are ahead. But we do fire again on the turn, which again I don't feel is unreasonable. But we are building now a pretty huge pot to the point where we may be putting our tournament at risk on the river, or if we are re-raised on the turn. So we go to the river, which comes the ace of clubs, so no flushes get there. Now what is the likelihood our opponent has an ace? I personally think it's extremely rare. I think it's a much better card for our remaining range than our opponent's. If they were calling us because they thought we had something like ace-queen, ace-jack, or ace-ten, then they have got to fear that we got there. Well, this makes it a decent bluff spot, but betting the river, we are absolutely causing our opponent to play perfectly. If we lead out here, they are only going to call us with hands that beat us. Ace-king, sixes, fives, three-three, and also maybe king-queen, king-jack, king-ten, if they don't believe that we have an ace. When we bet the river, we are very polarized. If I were the villain and this was the runout in my opponent's bet, I would think they either had nothing or a medium holding like they were like what we have that we're turning into a bluff or they had a monster. I would not expect my opponent to bet if they just finally hit an ace on the river. So this would actually become a good re-raise shove bluff for the villain. Frankly, even though we have taken an aggressive line all the way, I do like a check in this spot. I would probably call a river bet by my opponent here because the only hands I'm afraid of are ace-king, sixes, five-fives, and pocket threes. And I think the rest of their range they expect to be behind so they would turn into a bluff, which I can beat. The same logic goes for their river bet. 
If they just have an ace or just have a king, I would expect them to check the river back because of their showdown value. They should only be betting a polarized range, two pair or better, or nothing. And I can beat nothing with my pocket tens. So that's my thoughts on it. Uh, I'm excited to share with you the thoughts from Jonathan Little, Little, <laughs> Jonathan Little of PokerCoaching.com, as well as Chris Fox Wallace of Next Level Poker. So here are their thoughts. People are like, "Are you little? Because your name says you're little." I say, "No, I'm not little." Hello, this is Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com. Today we have a hand from a small stakes online six-handed tournament where we have about 28,000 chips at 250, 500. So that is about 56 big blinds. Our opponent seems to have gotten a lot of chips recently, from what I understand, playing somewhat poorly. So that is definitely worth mentioning. And we are nowhere near the money, so that's irrelevant. Um, Okay, so the villain and the cutoff, who has been limping sometimes, likes to raise to 1,000. So a min raise at 250, 500. Hero is in the big blind with pocket tens, with that 56 big blind stack and has to decide if he wants to call or three bets. And if you tell me the opponent is raising a decent amount of hands but limping occasionally, that usually means he's limping the worst hands and raising just most of the best hands. So that may actually make his raising range stronger than you may think. Um, That said, we do know the villain has a 17% preflop raise percentage over 56 hands, which isn't really a lot. And in reality, given the story I've been told, he's probably just gotten hit by the deck. But against a 17% raise, I think it's close between calling and 3-betting, mainly because we're out of position. I would typically 3-bet and be willing to play for all the money, but maybe that's a little bit optimistic, so I could certainly see calling being fine. This may be a spot where we're supposed to 3-bet and then fold to a 4-bet, but I really don't like that strategy, especially online, where we don't really know what the opponent's doing. Or, you know, we're just pretty much guessing what the opponent's doing. Anyway, in this hand, here are three bets to 3,500, which I think is fine. You do want to make it about 3.5 times the opponent's raise when you're out of position. And the opponent calls. So flop comes king, 6, 5. This is a great spot to either check or bet tiny. And by tiny, I mean a third pot or so. So the pot is about 7,500. So if I was in the hero's shoes, I would typically check, but I could see betting 2,500 being fine. And that's just because this is a spot that should be pretty good for most of our range. And when you have a very solid range advantage, you very often want to bet with a large portion of your range. In general, the hands you want to check are your marginal made hands. And uh, that's typically typically going to be under pairs to a king. So this is one of the hands you certainly would at least want to consider checking. Um, So either check or bet small. Either play is fine. So we did check. I'm sorry, we bet 3,500, so slightly bigger than I would have liked. And the opponent calls. The reason you have to be careful making a large bet, like let's say we're to bet 6,000 on the flop, is that then you're probably mostly going to get called when you're beat. Whereas when you bet small, like 2,500, your opponent may call with all sorts of hands that you beat. So turn is a three of hearts. The opponent, I'm sorry, we're we're first again. We decide to bet 4,000 now into about 13,000 chips or so. So a small bet. Kind of similar to the flop, if we are going to bet, we want to bet small. At this point, I would almost certainly just check, though, to induce bluffs and to induce overvalues from the opponent. It's like it's great whenever he just decides to bet his pocket sevens in this spot or decide to bluff with a queen jack that floated the flop. Um, if we bet, he may start to fold a lot of those hands, and that's certainly not what we want. He's not going to fold pocket sevens, but he'll fold queen jack, maybe ace high, etc. Um, either play is fine, though. Betting or checking small. At this point, given we're betting about a third pot, I think that's fine. This is another example of a spot where we certainly do not want to make a big bet. But the problem with betting is that now that the stacks are getting kind of shallow to where we're going to be in a pretty rough spot on the river. Um, we do decide to bet 4,000, though, and he calls. If we check and he bets really any amount, I don't think we should fold unless we think the opponent's very straightforward. And I don't really have any good information about that. So it's a tough spot for sure. River is an ace, which is horrible for us. Assuming we think the opponent's going to call a lot of the time on the turn with ace highs. If you think the opponent's going to fold a lot of his ace highs on the turn, though, then this river card is perfectly fine, right? Because he should have almost no ace highs unless it's ace king, which is kind of unlikely, ace six, and ace five. So this is a spot where I'm definitely going to check. 
If the opponent does have a king, he should very likely check behind because we could have a lot of aces in our range. So if he's going to check behind with a king, that means when he bets, he probably either has one of those two pair hands I mentioned or a lot of garbage that decided to somehow find its way to the river. Um, so if I check, it is usually to check call, but at the same time, maybe against a generic opponent in a small stakes game, we're supposed to check fold. Given this is a six-handed tournament, I think a lot of people, especially in the smaller stakes games, really overcompensate and try to run more bluffs than they typically would. So in this game, I would probably check call. Um, the question is, what is our plan? Check call, check fold, bet turn, etc. Should we turn our hand into a bluff trying to represent an ace? The hands you want to be bluffing are hands that have no showdown value in general, or hands that block the good hands that our opponent could have. In this scenario, there really are no good hands our opponent can have. So if we're going to bluff, we want to have no showdown value with a hand like maybe Queen Jack that decided to play this way, or a hand like 8-7 that decided to play this way, although you may not 3-bet this player with either of those hands. Um, so th these pocket 10s could be near the bottom of our range if we're primarily 3-betting for value before the flop. But at the same time, I think our hand probably has enough value as a bluff catcher. So I'm just going to check and look to check call. But this whole hand is a pretty dicey scenario, and this kind of shows you the downside of playing big pots where your whole stack is at risk from out of position. And perhaps, especially if you think your opponent's going to be really call happy, but at the same time is going to play well enough, maybe you just want to call pre-flop and look to bluff catch the whole way with your pocket tens instead of bloating the pot and not really knowing how your hand fares against your opponent's range. That's going to be it for me. This has been Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com. Fox here from Next Level Poker. I think this is an interesting spot because finally we have online stats. Uh, there were days 10 years ago where I used to analyze hands using online stats all the time, but that doesn't happen as often anymore. So I'm glad to have that back. And as with all tournament stats, you never have a huge hand sample on your opponent. So with cash games, sometimes we'd have 50,000 hands on an opponent, but um, you never have a big sample size on, on uh, tournament opponents unless you've played with them a ton of times. So uh, given that this guy is pretty loose, but he's got position on you and he's not doing a lot of folding, I don't think I re-raise here. Generally, my aggression factor online tends to be quite high. But I don't think you're getting folds hardly ever. He's just got a bunch of chips. We see that he calls. Um, you know, the two, the all-in 16 to 20 bigs with King Jack is is a little frisky. Um, I think this guy's calling if you three bet basically every time. And what you're doing is giving him information on your hand without really getting anything on his. I mean, when you know that he's going to just flat with 90% of the range that he open raised with, you don't really learn much from it. And... Since he's opening fairly early, I don't think um, you're going to learn a lot from him. Actually, I guess he was in the cutoff, but uh, you, I don't think you're going to get a lot of value from 3-betting him here. Because how far are you ahead of his range with a pair of 10s? Now, if this was queens, certainly kings or aces, then you have to 3-bet him here just for value. And just get more money in the pot when you're ahead. But you're out of position... The stacks are fairly deep. I wouldn't want to build a big pot here until I see a flop. I mean, you may be willing to get to a showdown with this guy. You may be willing to win a giant pot if you outflop. And there's all kinds of things that can happen here with a pair of tens. But I'd rather just see a flop. Completely disguise your hand. Don't tell him that you've got a real hand. Don't give him any chance to think about your hand range in that way. And don't build a big pot when you're out of position and you can't win it right now. I mean, you know, often the three betting is so that you can win the pot right now, especially when you're out of position. You really want to three bet when you can win the pot. In this case, I just don't think you can against the way that this player has played. The fact that he folded to a C bet three out of seven times is interesting. Maybe it makes, th uh, you know, three bet C bet a, an option here. But I like flatting here. Uh, in a cash game, I'm, I'm not necessarily flatting here, but in a tournament where you want to keep your variance low, I think a flat is okay. So that probably would have been what I did. But uh, against some opponents, I would 3-bet here for sure. Um, then you lead 3,500 on the king high flop. I think that's fine. 
I would C bet this flop if I had three bet. Um, but if you don't three bet, then you can just check call this flop. Or you could even check raise this flop. I mean, less of his range has a king than than half, quite a bit less. So if you check raise, he may just fold, you know, all the everything from like a pair of sevens to ace five to ace jack to, you know, uh, queen jack, all these tons of hands in his range will fold to a check raise if you just flat and then check raise the flop. But you could also check call the flop and let him keep betting, depending on your read about this player. But if you if you um, had just flatted here and there's three grand in the pot and then you check and he bets 2,000 and you raise to like 6,500, he's going to think you have a king almost all the time and he's going to fold a lot. Even a player like this who doesn't fold a lot, in that situation on this dry a board with just a one big card, he's gonna he's still going to fold a lot. So this would be a good board to check raise potentially bluff. I mean, you're kind of turning your hand into a bluff, but um, I would check raise bluff here a lot, and especially when you have a pair of tens to back it up. If he decides to get frisky and call, or if he's got a hand like seven eight, where he may decide to peel, then you've still got a lot of showdown equity. But you want to make that check raise big enough that you're not going to get called too often by junk hands because you don't really want to have to then figure out what to do for two more streets when you're out of position. You know, in position, this whole hand changes. Um, when the turn comes, given the way the hand has played out, I don't think a, a continuation turn bet is such a bad thing, but I would probably make it a little bigger to try to end this hand now, find out what's going on. Might make it 4,200, 4,300, something like that. Give it a little extra oomph behind it to get this guy to go away if he doesn't have a king. Um, I think checking's okay on the turn as well. Um, that's 4,000 that they bet on the turn. Sorry, I was looking at the hand history around. Yeah, I think uh, the turn bet's fine. And then that river against a player like this, I don't know if you can turn your hand into a bluff. And I think you're really, I mean, you're betting tens for value four streets, pre-flop and then three streets, or you're, or you're just turning them into a bluff, whatever it is. But I, I just can't see piling that much money in with tens. I mean, if that's a standard practice, you're going to go broke before you get to the money in almost every tournament just because you're giving away too much money to calling stations. I and mean, the primary mistake that people make in tournaments online is that they call too much against players who have it so i would wait and try and have it i think if you check here and he bets here you can fold i mean seven eight's the only hand that you can still beat and you know he probably is going to check behind a hand, a hand like ace five or ace six uh except for the ace came so then you're really like he's gonna you know he's gonna check behind pairs that are smaller than yours if he has a hand like six seven um you know hands like that he's going to check behind and be glad that he got to a showdown most times and he's only going to bet hands that beat you so i think you can check fold the river pretty easily if you end up getting to the river as he did in this hand okay thank you jonathan thank you fox uh, let's take a quick break here to thank our official sponsor running aces and then we'll be back with thoughts from our contributing recreational players Running Aces Casino and Racetrack has the best poker room in Minnesota, featuring 24-7 promos on all cash poker games, including earning $2 per hour in comps, plus the most player-friendly tourney structures. Visit RunAces.com for daily promotions and the tournament calendar. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, the official sponsor of Rec Poker. Okay, so let's close the episode off with input from our recreational players, Matt Hamilton, Don Ducate, Andy Kaplan, Rob Washam, Derek Smith, Steve Olson, and Doug Behrens. And all of them are audio with the exception of Mr. Matt Hamilton, who, by the way, is a fantastic young player. And he provided me some, uh, some written thoughts that I will share with you. So um, the, the first part of this is, uh, is Taylor's question on, um, on preflop, the three bet. Should we call here a three bet? And, and Matt says, you know, I would just call in this spot. This is the best hand I'm calling with here, as I'm three betting pocket jacks are better, but I think this makes a great spot to call, particularly versus a splashy opponent who is likely C betting every board, and we can play this type of hand conservatively and still win a lot of chips by calling down on a ton of boards. 
And then the next question was on the flop. Taylor had asked, what do we think of the C-bet on the flop? Matt says, I prefer a check on this flop, continuing with my conservative line, versus an opponent who has shown to C-bet a lot and continue putting chips into the pot. I'm more than happy to just come along for the ride. I do see merit for betting if you think your opponent will be calling a lot of ace-x, small pair, medium pair type hands, but checking them back if checked too. However, versus this particular opponent, who seems to like to take the betting lead, I think checking flops makes more sense. I don't feel you should be obligated to lead out just because you 3-bet pre-flop. And then in the turn, uh, given the call on the flop, do we continue here or check? Uh, and Matt says, it seems like a very clear check in this spot. If he was floating us on a flop with garbage, we can check to him and allow him to bluff. Well, if we bet again, those hands will likely fold. Additionally, we could be leading into a hand that's already beating us. And then finally, when we face the river, when the ace comes on the river, what's our plan? Check call, check fold, bet fold, turn our hand into a bluff with the ace? That's what Taylor asked, and here's what Matt has to say. He says, check fold. We put ourselves in a tricky spot if he bets the river, given that we have had the aggression the whole way. But I think a check fold makes the most sense here. Bluffing seems really bad because he has a lot of ace-5, ace-6, and king-x that won't fold, and then some missed straight draws that are losing anyway. This board has just simply got ugly. It's time to throw in the towel. All right, Matt, thanks. Uh, now let's hear from the other recreational players that submitted audio. Hi, my name is Don Ducate. I'm a rec player, and today we're discussing Taylor Moss's hand. Taylor Moss is our hero in the big blind. He has approximately 54 big blinds. Our villain, who is in the cutoff, has approximately 134 big blinds. Taylor starts the hand with pocket tens. Our villain opens for 1,000, which is a min raise. Our hero three bets to 3,500. I agree with this, considering our villain has played a lot of hands and he's very active. We know that we need to make him pay for that privilege. He didn't four bet, but that probably tells you he doesn't have aces or kings since he hasn't four bet at all. The villain does call, so on to the flop. So we get go to the flop and we get a rainbow flop with one over the king. The villain could have a king in his range, but he also has a lot of other hands that miss this flop. I think the C bet is fine. The hero C bets 3,500, which is fine. The villain calls. I think this tells you he doesn't have a nutted hand. I think he raises with trips and possibly ace-king. So he still may have a smaller pair or an ace-x in his range. The turn brings a three, and now there is a straight possibility on the board. But does this villain really play 4-7? I don't think so. We've seen him play a pair, ace-queen, king-jack. So I don't think he's playing 4-7. But I do check this turn to control the pot. I'd like to see what the villain does and take it from there. As played, Hero does bet 4,000. The villain calls, so on to the river. The river brings the nasty ace. I believe, believe the villain has plenty of aces in his range. And this is one problem that I have. I have trouble playing boards with overs to my pair. Do you continue to bet or not? Do you call a shove if we check and villain bets? Do we lose value by not betting? I think I do check here and fold to a big bet and call anything under a half pot bet. This has been Don Ducate for Rec Poker. Hey, this is Andy Kaplan on Twitter. I'm Andy S. Kaplan. Looking at this hand, the first thing I'll say is I'm not an online player. I very rarely play online. So the heads-up display information that Taylor provides, um, it's super cool. Um, I love looking at that stat, those stats, but uh, it's not something that I can really analyze very well. So I'm going to leave that to uh, maybe some of the online players or to Jonathan Little to look at. But you look at this hand, um, start out villains on the cutoff raises uh, two big blinds to a thousand you're in the big blind with pocket tens uh you raise three bet it to uh 3500 which is seven big blinds um i think that's a perfectly great place to three bet there you're out of position with a strong hand you're hoping to maybe just take down the pot uh with your pocket tens 
Unfortunately, the villain calls your three bet. Um, you've got 7,000 in the pot now, and you're moving on to the flop. Flop comes king, five, six. It's a rainbow flop. Um, you, the hero, I should say, is going to do a standard continuation bet here for seven big blinds, 3,500. I like a three bet here. I think, I think there's nothing wrong with that. You've got a dry flop. You're out of position, and you're doing a standard continuation bet with uh, a hand that could very well be the best hand. So uh, I like that uh, continuation bet. Uh, unfortunately, again, uh, the villain calls your continuation bet for 3500 and now the pot is getting really big. And when the hero calls that continuation bet, I think that's got to make some bells go off in your head and say that there's some danger here that perhaps your hand isn't... Uh, isn't isn't the best hand uh turn comes uh it's a three of heart it's a blank and at this point our hero bets four thousand on the turn for me i think i would rather check here i think i'm going to check here for pot control i think i'm going to check here to maybe check fold um i just think your pocket 10 seem to have decreased in value the villain has shown um interest in this hand um, I recognize this as a situation I see in my game as a leak where I feel like I've got the best hand and I get stubborn and I stick with a hand even though um, the information that's being provided is showing you that there's a good chance that maybe your hand is not the best hand. So my, my thoughts here is that instead of the bet on the turn, I check the turn, I either check call or more likely maybe check fold get out of the hand, move on to a, a better situation and, and try not to lose a lot of chips. You're avoiding a really bad spot where p- potentially you're going to get outplayed by a really good player or you're going to get beat by a player with a better hand. Either way, you're going to lose a lot of chips and I think maybe you're better off uh, getting out of this hand and, and, and getting in a better spot. So that's my thoughts on that one. Uh, it's Andy Kaplan. See ya. All right, this is Rob Washam for the February 17th Rec Poker Podcast. All right, today we're talking about a uh, hand that uh, my buddy Taylor sent in. So let's see what we can t- let's see what we can do with this thing. We already know he's got tens and all the preflop stuff. Blah blah blah. Uh, we have 56 big blinds effective, so it's a pretty good starting stack. Um. The villain in the cutoff raises a thousand, and we three bet to thirty five hundred with pocket tens. Um, okay, the sample size is small, um, not really reliable, but we know that he's a seventeen percent pre flop raiser, so that gives us a range of twos, all pairs, six five suited plus, ace ten off plus, king queen off, any of the suited aces, uh, queen ten suited, king ten suited all the way up to a king suited. Um, he limped with a uh, 2-2 earlier, but that was before he accumulated the sh- chip stack he has now, so I'd have to include even the small pocket pairs in his open range in the cutoff. Uh, we have about a 63% equity against this range, so we should 3-bet every time in this spot. If the villain 4-bets, you could fold and still have 49 big blinds. I don't know if I would 5-bet jam over a 4-bet, but if you just call your set mining with 10s out of position, which is a bad spot to be in. So if I face a 4-bet here, I would probably fold and wait for a better spot. As it is, he calls, and we go to the flop. All right, the pot size is now 7250. Uh, we got a stock-to-pot ratio of about 3.4, so we're right on the edge of determining whether we want to go all the way with this hand or not. Um... The flop is king five six rainbow, and uh, the question is: Should we see bet? Well, I think I'd see bet this all day long. Um, our three bet range is eights plus ace king off, ace queen suited plus all the suited uh, or ace two suited and to ace five suited. Um, and after his pre um, after his pre flop action, his range shrinks to uh, exclude the queen. Plus hands, king, queen, queen, king, king, ace, ace, and ace, king. Probably would have been uh, four bet. So after the flop, our range has about a 65% equity. 
and the king is actually good for our range. Um, we can get value from his sevens, eights, nines, seven, eight, six, seven, four, five. Um, so we see bet half the pot and the villain calls. The call indicates that the villain may have connected with the flop or that he is floating in position. There are a couple of kings in his range, but really only king, queen, or king, jack. With uh, pocket tens, we block most of the king, ten, and ace, ten combos. Uh, last but not least, we can't forget about suited ace, five, or ace, six. So villain's range looks like uh, five through jacks, ace, ten off, king, queen off. King-10 suited to King-Queen suited, and Ace-6 suited, Ace-5 suited, and probably the 6-5 to 9-8 suited connectors. All right, so um, the turn brings the three of hearts, so now we have two hearts on the board. Pot size is now 14,250, and we have 21,000 behind. Really a tough spot here. Been in this spot a couple of times where you're you're just kind of out in limbo right now, uh, and we're out of position, so it makes it pretty tough. I don't know, based on the calling range on the flop, there were 105 combination of hands the villain can hold. Uh, 31 of those combinations have us beat, so we still have decent equity here. I would bet here. Uh, bet size is obviously a problem because we're going to leave ourselves less than a pot size bet on the river if he happens to call. Um, should we consider moving all in here? I think that's a good question. We still have the aces, kings, and ace, king hands in our range, and we have fold equity as we have a one and a half pot size stack. As played, we bet 4,000 in villain calls. All right, pot size is now 22,250. We have 17K. Um, do we want to turn our hand into a bluff? I don't think we want to do that. It's kind of a value hand. But based on the range that we gave the villain throughout the hand, he just probably went ahead of our actual hand. It may be close versus our range, but he's ahead of uh, tens at this point. But I would be hard-pressed to bet this river. I think I would check, hoping for a free showdown, and I could see myself folding to any bet on the river. I know it's real nitty, but I just don't see him bluffing in this spot. And that's all I got for this week. Thanks for listening. This is Derek Smith, Everyday underscore 81 on Twitter, with feedback on the hand history supplied by Taylor Moss. In my opinion, his scenario and the different decision points makes for a really good example of just two of the many really important and often competing adages to remember when at the table. The first, and one I really believe in, is the idea of planning your work and working your plan. It's always important to have a plan for those hands you choose to play, and to think at least a street ahead and consider whether the actions you're taking both fit into your plan currently, but also allow for you to maintain it later. But on the contrary, no limit is a game where if you're, if you're inflexible, you'll never reach your full potential as a player, nor in your results. Einstein summarized it well when he said the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. And this hand does well at showing how these two differing ideas often arise in-game and within the same hand. So, what's our initial plan of action here? To summarize, we're in the big blind holding 10s to a min raise from a player in the cutoff who's been active of late. He's shown a willingness to play a pretty loose range and doesn't seem to mind getting a lot of chips in the middle. With this being the situation, my initial plan is to build a good but not huge size pot to get a fair amount of value out of my hand, which I feel is ahead of his range. So player the player one under the gun folds and villain opens a min raise to a thousand and it folds around to us with tens. And hero raises to thirty five hundred. Thoughts on to call or to three bet. Well I like three betting here. I see people post hand histories with HUD stats online and get roughed up by comments regarding the sample size not being large enough to make assumptions about opponents. In this case, the sample size 50 or so hands seems to fall into what online regs feel isn't significant enough a sample to draw any major conclusions about an opponent. But is that for sure true? 
Think of if instead we were playing live against the same player. At the table, we'll have had a chance to see a full five orbits, and so far I've seen this player make the over a half dozen plays that Taylor noted. We'd already be drawing some assumptions about that player if live, and would, in my opinion, be justified for doing so. That we're playing online now doesn't necessarily preclude us from making some general assumptions about our opponent, namely, he hasn't four bet yet and seems to be willing to fold to C bets. So getting some money in now, while perhaps less likely to be re raised, and taking it down with a C bet on the flop seems good and fits into our initial strategy for playing the hand if we instead call we get no definition on his range don't have the initiative and are kind of forced to then play the check call evaluate game for three straights streets excuse me we could call and donk bet the flop but i think that's going to look really steely and may prompt our opponent to re-raise and assuming we see at least one over on the flop we'll be in a bit of a guessing game as to whether or not to continue so though playing the hand passively and as a bluff catcher isn't terrible i prefer working our plan and making the three bet the flop's a king 5-6 offsuit the pot's 7250 and hero bets 3500 and asks should we see bet this flop I vote yes. Let's continue our plan of building a decent but not a too large size pot. To do so, we need to keep acting as aggressor. We very well could have strong kegs in our range, and this action may fold the opponent out and will win a solid pot. Or on this relatively uncoordinated board, with villain likely to expect a C-bet, they may float. This allows us to get a little more money in the pot while ahead and or being able to rep the king on later streets. Our bet size of just under a half pot does uh, well to represent building a good but not huge size pot, continuing our plan and helping us define our opponent's range further. Villain calls the 3500 and the turns of three of hearts and hero bets 4000 and asks, given the call on the flop, do we continue here or check? I think we still do want to continue here. Again, Villain's flop call does narrow his range some, and while holding a king is certainly a fair assumption, it also does look a lot like a float, and we could probably fill a full segment on the types of hands that would float here, but for the sake of being concise, I think continuing is best. If we check, in my opinion, he's going to bet whether he has the king or not, so by betting we force him to make a decision while further helping us define his range. I wonder just a bit about the size here, though. Just because it's only about a quarter pot, and though it fits into our plan of building cautiously, and as an aside sets up a pretty good SPR on the river, I wonder if a sharp opponent would see this as slightly weak and come over the top, likely forcing us to fold. I like to continue, but would maybe size the bet a bit larger, and really look forward to kind of hearing what other people think about this size later. As it goes, the villain calls the 4,000 and the river comes out. It's the ace of clubs. Hero has 17K, the pot's about 22,000, and he asks, what's our plan? Do we check call, check fold, bet fold, or turn our hand into a bluff with the ace? Well, I think this is the point where we need to be flexible and we need to deviate slightly from our initial plan of value, value, value. I think we've already achieved our goal of building a good but not huge pot and should now try to realize our equity. And so for that reason, my least favorite option is to bet fold. The reason that it's my least favorite option is if we're going to fold to a raise anyway, why wouldn't we just check? We can check and see what the opponent does and we can fold to a bet there. So I think leading out with the idea of folding to any re-raise is just a, a you know, kind of lighting our chips on fire at this point. So of the options presented, I think that's the, my least favorite. My third favorite option of the four listed was to turn our hand to a bluff with the ace and the reason for that is I just don't like this option because if I was the opponent in this hand I'd wonder what you the hero is trying to represent here if I held the king I know that you're saying you have an ace but how could you your bet is saying that you three bet pre with an ace and then barreled two streets just to get lucky and spike an ace on the river and unless we as the hero are trying to rep two pair here like ace five ace six maybe ace three the line just looks really odd would we have played as aggressively for two streets with second or third pair on the flop and even potentially fourth pair on the turn and if we did only have second through fourth pair wouldn't we have sized our turn raise bigger with the intention of forcing out an opponent versus inviting them to continue with our 28 percent pot bet all in all, I think repping the ace looks a little bit transparent, and I'd be really tempted to call if I was the opponent and held a king. So my favorite option at this point is checking and then deciding, and here's why. I don't know that we'll necessarily face a river bet, 
and if the villain checks back, I think we're likely to show the winner. If villain holds a king and checks back, though we will lose the hand, we'll still have 35 or so bigs to continue playing with, and if the villain has third or fourth pair, is he really going to summon up the courage to bomb this river? I mean, it's a really player-dependent question, so we just don't know. So I like checking and seeing what transpires. And assuming the villain does bet, here are the options of the two that we could do. My second favorite option is the check fold. I vote for this as second best just because I think if our opponent is willing to go bombs away on the river, especially after the ace peels, they're very likely to not only be beating our tens, but also have a pretty strong feel for our range. Sometimes you just have to give the nod to an opponent for playing the hand well. Even though knowing that we're playing online and we don't have the opportunity to pick up any sort of live tells to see if the player looks comfortable with their bet or or what they do, but I think if we check and they check back, we potentially can show over the winner. And if we check and they lead out, we can make our decision kind of based on how we feel about it. Um, though we're playing online, so we don't really have a lot of things other than sizings and timing tells. I think we can just evaluate how we feel about the hand and make our decision there. So of the four options that were available, I, my least favorite is bet folding. I don't love turning our hand into a bluff and repping the ace, and I really don't love check folding. So I think here I would check and make the call, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what other people think about this. In my opinion, this was a really good example of having a plan and working it, but being willing to adapt as needed. And again, look forward to hearing what other people think. Thanks. Hey guys, Steve-O here. Uh, another hand breakdown for the Rec Poker Podcast. This week we have a hand submitted by our own Taylor Moss. Taylor's playing an $11 six max online. Uh, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question since I haven't played a hand of online poker since Black Friday. I'm not sure how Taylor is, but maybe that's a question for a different podcast. Nonetheless, uh, he finds himself playing five-handed. Uh, there's 180 players left in the tournament. Taylor's sitting at 40, which is pretty good. 28,000 chips. Uh, it folds to the cutoff who raises a thousand to 1500. This particular player is sitting third out of 180. So he's very healthy chip stack, 67,000. Uh, it also, then it folds to Taylor in the big blind who has pocket tens. Taylor three bets to 3,500 and is called by the cutoff. Um, it's important to note here that the cutoff has been on quite a rush. He's played 10 out of the previous 16 hands. His chip sack has gone from 11,000 to 67,000. Taylor gives us lots and lots of information about the hands he's been playing. Um, I'm just going to narrow it down to a couple of the more important things. Uh, a, he's obvious, the player's obviously feeling it. Um, so it, his range could certainly open up. We're five handed, so the range is going to be opened up. Uh, he's six for six in showdowns. Which means he's probably not bluffing too much. Three of the show, or, uh, two of the showdowns look like they're they were all in preflop. Uh, once with ace queen, once with king jack, where they were limped both times. I think this is a kind of interesting. Um, you know, an ace queen limping five handed is pretty strange. Uh, you know, king jack, I can maybe kind of get it. Uh, Although calling an all-in with King Jack, you're probably behind, but it worked out okay for this player. Um, won the hand. Uh, I'm going to have to take a shot and say that Taylor is against a player that's maybe a little inexperienced um, for what it's worth. Anyway, blinds are 250,500. Uh, and the, the question that, that Taylor wants to know is submitted on um, the preflop action is, what are the thoughts on a call or a three bet? I would have to think that five-handed, my tens are good. Uh, I'm fine with the three bet. You, you could certainly make a, a case uh, to call and play your hand for the best hand. Um, you obviously are going to be playing that hand out of position. So I'm I'm fine with the call. I'm I'm good either way. Um, I don't think you know. I don't think it's a mistake three betting. Um, other than the fact that you got to know you're going to get called, uh, and you're going to be forced to play the hand um, out of position. 
The flop comes down, king, five, six, rainbow. Um, Taylor bets 3,500 on a continuation bet. The villain calls, um, you know, and Taylor's question is, uh, you know, do we continue or bet? Well, you know, you got, you know, we're, um, since we're called on that flop, what is, what is the opponent calling with? You know, did he really raise with, with six, seven suited? Possibly. Um, you know, four, seven, six, eight. Does he have a king? Did he limp with a hand like king, queen, considering his, his previous exploits? Um, hard to say. Anyway, Taylor bets, uh, 3,500 on the continuation bet is called the turns of three of hearts, which I, you know, really, really doesn't complete anything other than, than the four seven would have made a straight. Um, unless he just, you know, called it with pocket threes and he had a set. Both, both scenarios are pretty doubtful. There is two hearts on the board. Um, you know, do we continue or bet? You know, if we think of the tens are still good and the three's not going to change anything, I guess the right answer then there is to bet. Uh, Taylor does bet four thousand on the turn card and is called. You know, it, now we're heading to the river, so you got to think about what to do. You're called pre-flop. Uh, you're called on the flop. You're called on the turn. Uh, unless the river card is horrifying, you're going to get called on the river. Um, an ace hits the river. No flush is made. Uh, Taylor's got 17,000 left. Um, and the question posed by Taylor is, what is the plan now? Do we check call? Do we check fold? Do we bet fold? Well, I hate bet folding here. Um, it, it doesn't mean, you know, either you're good or not. Uh, you know, the question is, does your, does your opponent have an ace? Maybe he's got a hand like ace five, ace six. Um, you know, hard to say. And then, or do we turn our? And Taylor also poses the question: Do we turn our hand into a bluff with the ace? You know, if you're going to do that, you got to make sure you're against an opponent who's actually thinking about what you're holding and is somebody who just can't see past their own cards. Um, you know, like I said, if they've got a hand like ace five, ace six, you're just simply betting their hand for them. Uh, you can rule out ace king because I think obviously all the money would have went in pre flop if, if your opponent was holding ace king. You can hold, you know, same with aces. Um, you know, did he get called down by a hand like ace queen or ace jack? Possibly, you know, you're five handed. Um, it's hard to say. I think I'm probably just going to check call in this situation unless that bet is just outrageous. Uh, Taylor doesn't let us know how this hand ends up. Um, I'm interested to know. Hopefully, uh, hopefully Taylor's breakdown of this hand will come last in the podcast so we can hear how it turns out. Uh, my guess is if I'm going to look into my crystal ball Taylor is going to check and call a bet, uh, look like a hero when his opponent turns over either sevens, eights, or nines. That's my guess. That's it for this week. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Uh, hello, Rec Poker players. This is Doug Behrens uh, responding for the February 17th uh, Taylor Moz hand. Um, I think the whole crux of this hand is... Uh, deciding what type of player the villain is before we get involved with them. Uh, Taylor provided a bunch of statistics, which if you're playing online, use a heads-up display, uh, you'll know what these are. Uh, and the basic problem we have here is the, the villain played 40 hands in a very tight, a tight, nitty way, and then he played last 16 hands in a very loose, almost maniac way. So we don't know quite what type of player this is. His averages make him look uh, like a uh, tight aggressive player playing a few more hands than normal right now. Uh, he also either, you know, 
got unlucky or he's he's actually got some skill and he called some all-ins and did some other things that worked well for him, which were appropriate based on his chip stack and skill level. Um, so I'm saying the guy is a, skill, a skillful, tight, aggressive player who just got lucky and hit some hands and some boards most recently. As we come into the hand, that... Uh, should cause us some pause. This guy also has probably a chip leader position in the table. I wasn't sure of that. And we have a very large stack, but he's bigger than we are. So we have pocket tens in the big blind. This guy has made a min raise from the cutoff. What's that all about? That's very fishy. I, I call that an invitation bet. He doesn't want the blinds to go away. He wants you to call. Um... So this seems like a setup. Um, he's got enough chips to just buy the blinds if he wants to do that. Um, so um, anyways, he bets a thousand. We raise them to 3,500 with our uh, pocket tens and uh, the action's back on us right away and we have to decide what to do here. And if you really believe that this guy could almost be a nitty tight aggressive player, uh, and that you believe he might be setting you up, and you got a pair of tens, tens are sorta at the low end of the range that we're entering from the big blind when there's action before us, uh, we could just fold right here. Um, uh, you know, it, you know, that was true uh, before we saw the flop, too. Um, it's now more true uh, if and we were not going to fold on the flop, but we could check here and fold to his aggression. Just saying that this isn't the situation. I don't want to be a, you know, in against this uh, player uh, when, with this hand. Um, so the question then becomes, uh, do you check and fold if he gives aggression, or, or do you bet again, the 3,500 uh, again was what was chosen? Uh, I think if you want to bet here, um, you need to represent something uh, very strong like the aces and kings. Uh, and I think maybe betting... Uh, 7,000 after the flop. Oh, the flop was the uh, king of spades, five of hearts, six of clubs. Um, and rather than uh, uh, the, you know, a smaller bet size. So you either check and fold to aggression or bet more. And if he jams over the top of the seven grand, you just fold away. Uh, what this isn't the way this plays out, Taylor continues on the uh, turn and river to, to bet again. Each time uh, the turn was uh, three uh, hearts and that didn't really change the board or the information we have anymore. And then the rave river is an ace of clubs and that's w even worse. If the guy's playing a big ace, now we're crushed. Um, and so each time uh, the card comes, we are fold faced with continuation betting or checking and possibly folding. Um, I think by the time you get to the turn and river, you really don't have a good opportunity here for jamming all in, unless you're just 100% certain that you've got a better hand than this guy does and that he's some form of real lucky donkey here. Um, and I just don't see the evidence of that in the statistics that were presented. Uh, so I'm... You know, I'm trying to fold hands like a single pair uh, before I get that many chips on the table. And that, and that was the problem. We ended up at the river with 40% of our chips on the table and a hand that most likely is behind almost everything else that could have called us to that point. So um, that's my opinion. I can't dying to hear what everybody else has to say. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, Taylor, and to the to the Rex and the pros who gave feedback. Make sure you tell other people about us. If you want to wear a patch, let me know. If you want to 
you get a piece of my Vegas action, let me know. Uh, otherwise, if you have any other feedback, topic suggestions, hand situations, what do you think of the new format or the adjusted format, let me know on Facebook, Twitter, or email me at stevefredland at gmail.com. And we'll be in touch, and we will chat with you next week.